Mike Pankowski. I'm the CEO of JIMSA. Thank you very much for coming to our event. Uh, what's the deal with Iran? Um, uh, so uh, this is our first time, actually. We did a lunchtime event, and uh, I think we, uh, it, was, it was a good idea. Um, this is uh, we, the, the reason for the, the purpose of this event is uh, several fold. One we, uh, we're releasing today is you've got up front or take it on your way out. Uh, the uh, the uh, our Gemunder Center and Iran Task Force report on the assessment of the interim deal on Iran. Um, and as you probably all know, the deal was just uh, signed and it was implemented on uh, last week on January 20th. Also, President Obama's State of the Union address is tomorrow, and Andali is going to discuss Iran. Of course, Sec Secretary of State Kerry talked about it in Davos just last week, so there's a lot of Iran news going on right now, and we wanted to give uh, to share our views of uh, 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 of this deal. Now, uh, as many of you can see on the report, this uh, our task force uh, is co-chaired by Ambassador er uh, Dennis Ross, who's here. Uh, and uh, Ambassador Eric Edelman, and um, and also the other members on the panel here today, Steve Rademacher, Ray Take, and, and you can see in the uh, report that you probably picked up, other members of the task force, including <coughs> Elliot Cohn, uh, General uh, Dave Diptula, General Chuck Wald, and a few others. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the uh, presence of Jensen's Chairman Michael Nachman here today, who's coming from New York. Um, so let me just briefly, before I turn it over to the panel, uh, let me just briefly uh, review a few key highlights of the report. I know everyone in Washington reads every word of every report that's ever put out, but I'll just uh, uh, I'll just take stuff from the executive summary, which is better now, and just highlight a few key points. Uh, we believe the uh, JPA, the uh, Joint uh, <coughs> Plan of Action is deeply flawed because the combination of interim and final concessions it contains undermines the effort to prevent a nuclear run. In our previous report, and we held a, a panel discussion on that uh, several months ago, um, uh, in our previous report in the run-up to Geneva, we, we laid out six main principles that we thought uh, for any acceptable deal, and we believe that the interim deal that was just signed uh, the implement on January 20th violates most of those six principles. Uh, and those six principles are Iran needs to uh, resolve outstanding international concerns, it has to adhere to its international legal requirements, it has to roll back its nuclear program, the place, uh, there has to be in place in Iran a strict inspections regime, there has to be clear deadlines for Iran to uphold its commitments so it doesn't run out the clock, and the U.S. needs to negotiate and enforce any deal from a position of strength to make it unmistakably plain to Tehran as the most to you uh, to lose from uh, failure of diplomacy. Now, the aim of this report uh, is to show where the agreement falls short of these uh, of the of our uh, six principles, explain the risks generated by these shortcomings, and try to provide some recommendations for uh, pursuing a final agreement to prevent a nuclear Iran. Um, as we made clear in our previous reports, uh, this task force continues to believe that the optimal solution outcome would be for Iran with no enrichment capability whatsoever. Now, some in our task force believe that the only acceptable deal uh, uh, is one that involves the complete dismantlement of Iran's nu uh, military nuclear program, but there are some in the task force who believe that that's no longer practical or feasible and are willing to and reluctantly accept a very minimal Iranian nuclear program. I know that will be discussed in the panel. Given that the, G, uh, the JPA grants Iran greater concessions than it extracts, and considering how close Iran is to nuclear weapons capability, we believe that a final permanent deal that fulfills our principles must be put in place as soon as possible, preferably before the JPA's six-month interim uh, deadline expires. Now, uh, this will require the United States in all form of its leverage, that means sanctions, that means uh, credible military preparations and tighter cooperation with our allies, uh, and we believe also clear support for a military strike by our allies, particularly Israel, if they decide to do that. 
Now, the United States should move immediately, we believe, to impose new sanctions and consider even tougher sanctions against Iran if no acceptable final agreement is in place 180 days after the JPA's implementation, which in this case would be July 20th. At that time, the United States should do nothing that would impinge upon Israel's ability to decide what action it must take at that time and indeed support Israel if it takes military action. I will now turn the proceedings over to our distinguished moderator, Jackson Deal, who is the deputy editor of the Washington Post, excellent editorial page, and one of the leading foreign policy voices here in town and across the country. You'll be moderating, moderating our, our panel. Jackson. Thank you, Mike. I'm really looking forward to today's discussion because we've got a terrific panel here, and I think we're going to hear some different points of view about where exactly we are uh, in moving forward with these negotiations in spite of the fact that we're being on the same task force. In addition, Michael, we have, as I'm sure everyone here knows, Ambassador Dennis Ross, uh, who's the former Special Assistant to President Obama, <coughs> and the NSC Senior Director uh, for the Central <coughs> Region, and is now at the Washington Institute for Middle East Policy. We have Steve Rodemaker, the former Assistant Secretary of State for Arms Control and Nonproliferation of the Bush Administration, who was deeply engaged with these issues at that time. And Ray Taki, who's the Senior Fellow for Middle Eastern Studies at the Council for Foreign Relations, and an expert on Iran's domestic policy. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to ask them a few questions and later we'll open up for discussion. And to begin, I'm going to ask each of them uh, to address a specific topic and to tease out a little bit uh, uh, a sort of a contradiction I saw in the report, because the report here says, if you haven't had a chance to read it, because of the flaws uh, that the task force found in the JPA, some task force members believe the deal is unacceptable. Uh, and, and believe the United States must still press for a final agreement permitting Iran to keep only a civilian nuclear power program with no enrichment facilities or capabilities. But other task force members believe the JPA, while not the best solution, provides an opportunity to test Iran's true, true intentions definitively with an endgame proposal. So I think we've got two slightly different tactical views of where we should go forward, and so I'd like to start by asking Steve to address one side, which I think is the unacceptable side. <laughs> I think, um, is the microphone working? No. Now can you hear me? Better? Um, I, I don't want to get into to say whether I think this agreement uh, is acceptable or unacceptable, but I, because I, I want to um, focus on what I think are some of the, the um, uh, serious shortcomings of the agreement, uh, shortcomings that I hope uh, can be corrected as uh, negotiations continue. Uh, there, there's some good things and bad things in the agreement in the short term. Um, or maybe I should say good things for, for our side in the short term and good things for the Iranian side in the short term. The Iranians get some sanctions relief, although not complete sanctions relief. They get some, uh, some assets that are currently frozen overseas will be returned to them. Um, th those are good. They, they are not going to be subject to the tightening of uh, our petroleum sanctions. And that's, that's a commitment uh, that they've received. So those, those are benefits to them in the short term. Uh, in the short term, we get benefits to restrictions on their activities. Uh, probably elimination of half of their, their uh, more highly enriched uranium stockpile. Um, but I, I'm focused more on the longer term. And it's with regard to the longer term that, that I'm troubled by uh, what I see in the agreement. And there, there are two features in particular that um, cause me concern. Uh, the first is, you know, we've had this debate, and I guess it continues, about the so-called right to enrich. Um, the Iranians insist they have a right to enrich. The Obama administration uh, insists that there is no right to enrich under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And further, they insist that they, they haven't um, capitulated on that position in this agreement. Um, I, think that's a, I think that's a hard uh, position to maintain, um, and I think it can only be maintained by splitting hairs. You know, it, it basically, if, if you keep it at the level of the debate between law professors, or maybe I should say international law professors, uh, you know, is there a right to enrich? Has the right to enrich been recognized or not? I suppose there's a, 
one could contend that the, there is not a recognition in here that under Article 4 of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, there is a conventional international law right to enrich. I mean, that, that, that position can be maintained. But I'm not sure, or actually, I don't think that's ever what the Iranians cared about. I think what the Iranians cared about is they wanted to be allowed to enrich. Okay. Talk, if, do they have a legal right under Article 4 of the NPT to do it? Is that the, is that the legal basis uh, for, for what they're doing? Or is it just that they're doing it and nobody's complaining about it? Um, I think they would be satisfied with the latter. Uh, because once you stop complaining about it, then of course you're not really in a position to sanction them over it or otherwise try to penalize them. Or uh, you know, we basically would have to stop pestering them about what they're doing. And I, I think they've always referred to that as recognition of the right to enrich, but you know, I, I think we're getting kind of wrapped around the axle on whether it's a legal right or whether it's some other kind of right. I think the critical question is, going forward, is, is anybody going to quarrel with the ability of Iran to enrich, the fact that they're doing it? And it's crystal clear from, from the JPA that uh, the Obama administration and the other participants and the negotiating process have decided that going forward they're not going to quarrel with the fact that enrichment's going to be going on in Iran. And to me, that's troubling. Uh, to set aside these, you know, these arcane debates among lawyers, they're, they're going to be able to do it in the future. Uh, we're not going to object to it. Uh, I, I think that's a huge win for the Iranians. It's, it's been an issue, uh, a dispute up until now, but the, the JPA is crystal clear that, I just read the language, that the, the long-term agreement will involve a mutually defined enrichment program with mutually agreed parameters consistent with practical needs. Um, you know, I'm sure the Iranians will have some practical needs that they'll draw our attention about the nature of the program they need to have. We, we, we may have some practical needs about verification, but uh, the point is there's going to be enrichment going on in Iran and we're not going to object to it. Um, and that, that, that troubles me. The second thing that troubles me is um, it's also clear from this agreement that we have an interim agreement now and then we're going to have what they call a long-term agreement. But it's specified in the interim agreement that the long-term agreement is not a permanent agreement. And that, um, you know, again, I'll just read from, from the interim agreement. Following su successful implementation of the final step, that is the long-term agreement, the Iranian nuclear program will be treated in the same manner is that any other nuclear weapon state part, or I'm sorry, any of any non-nuclear weapon state part of the NPT? In other words, there will be no special requirements levied on Iran that are different than the requirements that apply to other countries with civil nuclear programs. Again, that, that is a huge win for the Iranians because uh, you know, we'll have a debate now in the negotiation about how long the long-term agreement will run, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. The Iranians have been promised that at some point, you know, five years, ten years, fifteen years. Uh, all of these restrictions will go away and they will be able to do whatever they want, subject only to the, the same kinds of, of verification obligations that all other countries with civil nuclear programs are subject to. So I would say in the short term, there, 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 there are benefits to both sides in this agreement. In the long term, uh, this agreement is hugely beneficial to the, the positions that Iran has taken over the years. And um, you know, I, I think their diplomats can go home well satisfied that they've accomplished a lot for the country. Dennis, do you want to talk about why this would provide an opportunity to test Iran's uh, intentions? Yeah. <clears throat> Let me pick up on a few things that Steve said. One, I'll start by saying uh, I'm not one of those who thinks that the agreement is that bad. I do think, as Steve said, there are benefits. There are benefits, it's fair to say, for both sides. But I'd say for us, you do cap their program, and you do create uh, inspections that are better than we've had. Uh, and uh, and I think that is something that is a, a benefit, and, it's a, and it shouldn't be dismissed. I agree that uh, you can say there's no right to enrich, but uh, when you read the agreement, as Steve just did, what's clearly here is that there's an acknowledgment that at the end of the day there's going to be enrichment in Iran. And the question comes down to, uh, can you live with some enrichment versus the issue of no enrichment? Now clearly, from a, from a non-proliferation standpoint, if you could get no enrichment, that would be the best thing. Again, think about it from the standpoint of this region. Every country will watch what the outcome of the agreement is, and they will insist that what the Iranians get, they get too. 
So it would clearly be better if no one was enriching and if they were getting their fuel from the outside. Now the question is, is that an achievable agreement through diplomatic means and can we live with Iran having a very limited enrichment program with very intrusive uh, verification means to ensure that you can verify the limitations that are being imposed on them. Uh, it is true that, as you raised in your question, that we have different views within the, uh, within the group. Uh, and I am on the side of those who say it is, it is uh, better to accept what would be a very limited program with the kinds of restrictions that could be verified for the following reasons. Uh, first and foremost, I think it does at least give you the possibility of an agreement. But secondly, if we want to be able to produce more sanctions, credibly on an international basis, and if we want to be able to be in a position where we can use force, we have got to put a proposal, a comprehensive proposal on the table that will be seen by the rest of the international community as being highly credible. If we put a proposal on the table that has no enrichment, I suspect that we will find that there are many, including many within the 5 plus 1, but not limited to that, who will feel that that's not sufficiently credible. I want to put Iran in a position where we put them to the test. So the fact is, if we put a proposal on the table with no enrichment, they will claim that, in fact, this wasn't fair to them, and others will somehow see that that's appropriate. If we put something on the table that allows them limited enrichment, and they turn it down, it's limited enrichment that requires a massive rollback of their program, and they turn it down, then, in effect, you have unmasked the Iranians. They claim all they want is civil nuclear power. They claim all they want is civil nuclear energy. They have no interest in having nuclear weapons. Uh, and if you put a proposal on the table that the rest of the world finds highly plausible with the kind of limits I'm describing, uh, and they turn it down, then you're in a position to say, look, we demonstrated they weren't interested only in civil nuclear power. What they want is either nuclear weapons or to be a nuclear weapons threshold state. And that's unacceptable. So from my standpoint, if you, if you want to put us in the best possible position to maintain leverage on the Iranians, and not put them in a position where suddenly they're able to gain the high ground, then I think you have to go with something like I, what I was just suggesting. And that's why I favor uh, a limited enrichment approach. Now I want to turn to Ray and, and please comment on this, um, this division, Ray, if you want to. But I'd also like to ask you, just as an expert on, on Iran and Iranian politics, how, this, how the Iranians are debating this same degree. And they're, they're having, so far as I can tell, some of the same debates there about whether this is a good deal or not a good deal for them. How, how do you think that's playing out? And what do you think... Uh, the prospects are for them going forward in terms of uh, conducting the negotiations? How serious do they look? Uh, thanks. Uh, I actually, from my observations, this agreement is less contentious in Tehran than it is in Washington today. Uh, <coughs> for a number of reasons. Uh, I think the Supreme Leader laid out three conditions for an acceptable nuclear agreement. At, at least at the interim level. Namely that there'll be no suspension, no nuclear facilities would shutter, and no material would leave the country. Uh, this particular agreement has fulfilled those three particular parameters, broad red lines that he established. And therefore, uh, I think the essential institutions of the state are in some kind of an alignment. That's the Office of Presidency, the Office of Supreme Leader, and the relevant ministries, intelligence, and others that debate this issue in the Supreme National Security Council. It has been the refrain of the Iranian government that they are under hardline pressure and so on. I was always skeptical of that claim, but I'm beginning to see a little more evidence of it. Uh, there was a discussion about the parliament wanting to have a supervisory committee to oversee this particular negotiations. And although that report has been denied and others, I think there's more to it. Uh, therefore, I think that as the Iranian government moves into a more difficult stages of negotiations, the comprehensive agreement, uh, that these issues are going to be debated much more strenuously. I think the foreign ministry and the office of presidency, Mr. Rouhani and Foreign Minister Zarif, the way they negotiate treaties is they are willing to give in on some interim measures for long-term concessions. 
So therefore, what they really, I think, will be focusing on is the duration of the comprehensive agreement. Uh, if, and the more demands you have in terms of how many centrifuges are going to be rolled back, let's say you, get, you guys can only have 4,000 centrifuges, General Zanik will say, if I'm going to take this back, then the duration of the agreement has to be five years. If you give me 10,000 centrifuges, it will be 10 years. I, I think that's the kind of negotiations you'll see. Uh, but I think as this moves forward, this is going to be much more contentious. I'll, I'll say one thing on the debate that Dennis and Steve has, and just put it in a historical perspective if I can. Uh, it has been the, and Steve and I were talking about this, it is the administration's position that the United States government does not recognize Article 4 of the NPT as giving anybody the right to enrich. Why? It's a position, that's not the position of Germany, that's not the position of Britain, that's not the position of Russia. Uh, that position actually evolved in the 1970s. Uh, we took a position that we are against this article being interpreted in this way because we were against proliferation of this material. material. So the notion of non-recognition in principle was coupled with non-recognition of practice. It was zero enrichment. In the 1980s, that paradigm becomes modified, where a number of allies, Brazil, Japan, began to enrich, and we adopted a different position, namely that we don't recognize their right to enrich, but we're not going to object to it in practice. The interesting and important thing about JPA is it has taken <coughs> that paradigm that was previously applied to allies and has applied it to adversaries. And that's what's so important about JPA. Uh, it is an important landmark in four years of American counterproliferation policy. Uh, and that's something that has already happened, and that's the fact of life. Uh, but going back, I think this agreement, as you go forward, will be more contentious within Iran. And I think JPA does it introduce an important landmark in American counterproliferation and nuclear policy. Thanks. I want to explore a little bit deeper this, this question of enrichment versus non-enrichment. And I want to do it by bringing up a phrase that you see throughout this report and seems to be, and I want Michael to start with this, this, this sort of central idea they were working with, which is undetectable breakout capacity. And the report seems to be centered a lot on how do we stop Iran from obtaining an undetectable breakout capacity. Uh, and so I wonder how enrichment versus non-enrichment actually fits into that. Because you know you hear people often make the argument uh, here that, that what we're really talking about is time and inspections. Uh, that you, you can't take away Iran's knowledge of how to enrich uranium or how to build a centrifuge, or for that matter, how to build a nuclear weapon. So the question is, how far do you push them away from building that weapon, that Britain, that's the breakout capacity, and how rigorous are your inspections so that you will know, so that any breakout they attempt will be detectable. So I wonder if, if that's what you're worried about, breakout capacity and whether it's detectable or not, why, why does it matter in the end of the day whether they have 1,000 centrifuges or zero centrifuges? And Mike, could I ask you to start and just explain to us a little bit this concept of undetectable breakout capacity and why that seems to be so important to the task force? Yeah, all right, thank you, Jackson. Can I, I just say one thing about the discussion before and then I jump on this? Yeah. I'll just say one thing. Just about why I think this was a bad deal uh, is that uh, we call it deeply flawed in the report. Is um, I, I think the administration has made some arguments of why they felt an interim deal was necessary, but it seems to me whatever deal we have now will only, whatever leverage we have now will only get weaker, and therefore the deal it, it undercuts sanctions, uh, they get sanctions relief. Uh, it's clear that the administration talk about military options is not credible. No one believes it. Their hostility to their opposition to sanctions legislation now has also undercut our leverage. I think that it stands to reason with their economy going to improve uh, with the sanctions relief. With no other levers that we're using right now, uh, that whatever deal we that this deal, the six month deal, will then be renewed as it talks about. So this, the Iranians will have more time uh, to build up, and this will be a segue to answer your question, they'll have more time to uh, build up their stock of 5%, uh, 3.5% uh, enriched. And uh, meanwhile, 
uh, endangering the um, and, and endangering the whole sanctions regime. I, I just don't understand from a negotiating standpoint. I know Dennis wrote a whole book on this, so maybe at some point he could raise it, but why you would want to do an interim deal when your leverage is, is much more now than it will be in six or 12 months. It just seems like we've, we've just weakened our position and that our that whatever deal, if there is a deal, and it's very unlikely there will be a permanent deal, whatever deal that emerges, if there is one, will be significantly worse than we could get today um, if there is one today. Meanwhile, we're hamstringing our, we're undercutting the legitimacy of the military strike our allies, particularly the Israelis, and I think that's the one stick uh, here right now is a threat of an Israeli strike, and I think this deal, at least, it might not, it doesn't freeze Iran's nuclear capability, but it does seem to freeze Israeli action for at least six months. And I think that's a very bad thing. So now to answer your question about undetectable. So uh, the issue is that, um, look, there are three parts to a nuclear weapon. Just to, or a nuclear bomb, just to clarify. So there's the fuel, there's the bomb, there's the delivery mechanism. Uh, nuclear weapons capability is when you have all those three elements, but you can't even like figuratively turn the screw to put them together. Uh, the key issue is, to answer your question, Jax, is that you want to lengthen the time that they could develop nuclear weapons capability before it could be detected. Now, why this deal hurts that is because, because the idea is not just that it gets detected, but it gets detected and that we could act on it. So that, that, and historically, and this is not a criticism of U.S. intelligence agencies, it's a very difficult thing to do. We've never predicted before other countries breaking out. And it's, so we would have to detect this, and we would have to have time to decide whether to act on that, what we found out. And you'd want to lengthen those periods of time uh, as much as possible, and uh, and I think the deal that uh, Dennis is referring to might lengthen it to a couple of years, uh, which I can understand that position certainly. Uh, so um, the, the problem with this deal, however, is that they're still able to enrich under five percent. They're converting their twenty percent, half of it's converted to the five percent, and the other half is getting converted to this oxidized form, which can be converted back. And unlike what Secretary Kerry, I think, said at Davos last week, they can't, they, he said they don't have that capability converted back, and they will not. How do we know that? Actually, it's assumed that they do have that capability without what capability that is, experts disagree. So I think they're gonna be, and there's another element here which we talk about in the report, is that, yes, it's true that they're not allowed to install more advanced centrifuges, what are called IR2s, uh, but they are able to increase the efficiency of, their, of the IR1s and replace their existing centrifuges with these more efficient centrifuges. Uh, in effect, actually getting them closer to nuclear weapon capability, and that's something that could offset some of the benefits of the plan, uh, of the deal. So, in, in a sense, the problem with the deal is that they're able to uh, increase their stockpile of the 3.5%, even if they're diluting the 20%, that could be reconverted back to the 20%. And uh, so, therefore, I don't, I think, uh, time-wise, it's debatable whether this deal, one, it actually does push it back. Some experts say it pushes it back a month or six weeks, some say two months. But actually, if they improve their efficiency of their centrifuges, that could offset some of those delays, uh, those, those delays. So it could be that they get closer. Meanwhile, they're increasing their enrichment stockpile, which will allow them, if they want to at some point, perhaps, they'll have more, they already have enough five and a half, uh, three and a half percent for a couple bombs. They're gonna be able to have more of that going forward. So therefore, they, if they want to break out at some point, they'll be able to break out quicker with more, uh, and create more bombs. So I don't know if that someone answered you. Yeah. Dennis, if, you, if, if, you, if the goal is undetectable breakout capacity, can't you get there if Iran has 500 centrifuges? Well, it makes it a whole lot harder for them, particularly if you combine the limitations, the rollback, with very intensive, intrusive uh, verification means, 
One of the things the Iranians, uh, in a sense, don't know is what we know. You often hear about, all right, we don't know if there's, if they have a, if they've hidden something, but the truth is, they've never revealed their enrichment sites. They've always been revealed from the outside. Uh, and we've done that. So, if you have, uh, if one of the things you negotiate are extensive verification means that are in every link of the chain. And for the first, I mean, you see in this agreement, by the way, there's a reference to where they mine uranium, where they mill it. Uh, if you are in a position where you can inspect where they mine uranium to see if anything's being diverted, where they mill it to see if anything's being diverted, where they convert it to see if anything's being diverted, where they enrich it to see if anything's being diverted, where they're building their centrifuges, where they store their centrifuges to see if, in fact, that's the case, it becomes harder and harder for them to cheat. And even if they try to cheat, you're, the prospect of you being able to discover it, and this gets back to the point that Mike was making, in a timely way, uh, is going to be there. Now, that's more credible the smaller the number of centrifuges that they have. Ray was saying that if the Iranian approach is, if you, you know, if, if we're at 4,000 centrifuges, five-year deal, if we're at, you know, we'll give you 10 years for 10,000, those would be bad deals. I mean, at the end of the day, we can debate whether it should be permanent or non-permanent. What shouldn't be debatable is that the number of centrifuges and the quality of the centrifuges has to be, there, there can't be, in my mind, there can't be next generation centrifuges. And the number they have have to be very small. Uh, and then that has to be combined with the kind of intrusive means that I was talking about. And that, I would, my try. I would like to roll them back to about where they were two years ago. And so that we would have, at least we would have a kind of two year we have that kind of a rollback so we'd be in a position to, I think, have a pretty good insight into, into what is going on, have the time to be able to detect what they're doing and have the time to do something about it, I would add one other thing. I do think any comprehensive deal has to also build into it consequences for their cheating. Because if there aren't any consequences for their cheating, well, then they, they may still have some incentive to do it. I might just, you know, Mike asked the question, why would you... Why would the administration negotiate this kind of a deal? Well, there's a logic to it. The logic to it is that the, you know, there, there is a cap on the numbers, uh, and there's a cap on what can be accumulated as well, I mean, meaning they can't exceed what they've accumulated so far. It is true what you said. Because they're able to do research, because they're able to replace those centrifuges that break down, they're putting themselves in a position where they'll be, at the end of six months, if this is the end of the deal, they're going to be more capable than they were uh, at the beginning of it. But one of the things that the, the, the administration had constantly been hearing was that the clock is ticking, the clock is ticking, you got to get a deal. So what they tried to do was say, all right, look, we think that with Rouhani, uh, there's a chance to do a comprehensive deal. We can't get it done now. It's going to take some time. If for the next six months they keep adding what they're doing, then it's going to be harder and harder for us to sustain the diplomacy. Uh, it may be harder and harder for the Israelis not to act militarily, so let's stop the clock from that standpoint. That was the logic of it. Now, one can say that they lost their leverage. The key will be, the, the proof of what they've lost their leverage is going to be in the pudding. Critics of the deal will say the psychology of the market is taking over. Uh, you already see companies going, uh, trade delegations going to Tehran, uh, and the fact is, once deals are struck, that really will take on a life of its own. Now, the truth is, so far, deals haven't been struck. If it turns out that deals aren't struck, if it turns out the administration continues to designate, if it turns out that the administration is very active in terms of raising the reputational cost of anybody trying to do business, uh, it may well be that the leverage doesn't decline. All that's going to be required. Uh, and and I would say, you know, this is, we can get into this, uh, you know, the the, no, the notion from the Iranian standpoint that if there is no deal, you know, they don't get this kind of, they're not going to get the kind of economic relief, and in fact the pressure is going to become dramatically worse, the factors that produce them coming to the table will at least put you in a better position to get a deal. Whether it's enough to get a comprehensive deal or not, I don't know. I have, I have my doubts. You know, the fact is the President says he thinks the prospect of a deal is less than 50-50. The Deputy Foreign Minister in Iran has said he thinks that may be a high estimate. 
Uh, all that leads me back to the position that I started with. I want us to be in a position where we have the high ground to be able to, to effectively adopt more sanctions, or if force has to be used, to be in a position where we can say the Iranians brought this on themselves. See, why can't you prevent an, an Iranian undetected breakout capacity while still letting them have a few centuries? Okay. Uh, let me adapt that question a little bit. You know, I understand the logic of, of, of Dennis's position. Uh, I, I don't agree with it. Um, because, to my mind, there's a bright line between no enrichment and some enrichment. And you can maintain a position of no enrichment. Um, but once you step across that line and say, OK, we're going to allow some enrichment, um, you know, Dennis comes up with good numbers. We're, we'll only allow them a, a thousand centipedes. Um, I guess I would predict that it would be very hard to sell to our allies in the, the, the P5, uh, or, I'm sorry, the EU3 plus 3. Um, the idea that 1,000 is acceptable, but 1,100 additional bright line. Um, well, actually, I take that back. There is one additional bright line. It's the one that they, they evolved to in, in the, uh, the JPA, and that is uh, basically the status quo. Uh, the JPA does not require Iran to dismantle a single, dismantle or stop operating a single centrifuge. So that's another bright line. There's no further expansion. And that's the one that they were, that our negotiators were able to achieve. Um, now, you know, it may be that in the follow-on negotiation, there'll be an effort to get them to prepare that back. But I, I, again, I think it's hard to justify any other line that you want to draw. Um, but I guess beyond that, my, my biggest concern with the JPA is not, I mean, I, you know, this is a tactical, I would say, the genocide is that is a tactical issue. Um, my concern is the, the second point that I made when, when I first spoke, which is, We've already committed that the long-term agreement is not a permanent agreement, and at the end of the long-term agreement, there will be no restrictions. So Dennis you know, talks about how important you know, special intrusive verification is, the limitations on the number of centrifuges. Your question, you know, if we limit the number of centrifuges, uh, can we be assured that there's no breakout capability? Well, potentially, in theory. But we've already promised that we're going to have those, those assurances, those capabilities, that, that intrusive verification, only for a set period of time. And at the end of that set period of time, the Iranian nuclear program will be treated in the same manner as that of any non-nuclear weapons state party of the NDP. So we've already promised that whenever this all ends, and you know, really what's to be debated is what's that period, but there is going to be a period, and that period is going to end. We've agreed to that. And at the end of that period, Iran is going to be treated just like Japan, just like Canada, uh, in terms of verification, in terms of the limits on their enrichment and reprocessing capabilities. And um, for the Iranians, that's a huge win. Uh, you know, I, I think if somebody went to Iran today and said, you, know, you, have, to, you have to stop already all your centrifuges for the next hour, and at the end of that hour, you can do whatever you want. Yeah, I, I think they'd, they'd buy that. And if it were a day or a week or a month, they'd still probably buy it. Uh, if it were 50 years, they probably wouldn't buy it. But, you know, that's what the negotiations will be about. It's going to be about the period of time during which they are going to be subject to whatever restrictions our negotiators can achieve, numerical restrictions on number of centrifuges, level of enrichment, amounts of, of enriched uranium stockpile. Um, and likewise, the, the, the more intrusive verification to which the Iran can be subject. But at the end of that period, it all goes away. And that's already been conceded in, in the JPA. And that, that's why I think this is a really bad deal. Ray, can you imagine the Iranians at the end of this process in six months or maybe a year's time agreeing to dismantle 12, 15, 18,000 centrifuges? And will the, will, will the political traffic bear that inside Iran? Well, this is, a, this is sort of a curiosity between Dennis and Steve debate. Dennis's idea of limited enrichment is 1,000, and Steve wants to go down to zero. An Iranian government that accepts 1,000 centrifuges is an Iranian government that probably accepts zero enrichment. An Iranian government that rejects zero enrichment is an Iranian government that rejects 1,000 centrifuges. Uh, I don't see anything in the political discourse or what they're saying. I don't have access to the private council that suggests they're willing to dismantle the level that is being discussed, whether zero or 1,000. I, I don't see it. Now, you know, uh, one thing I have realized is, you know, people have different positions and 
you know, the modifications of that take place. But I, I, I guess Jackson, I see more of this. That may be so, but in a sense, you know, because they've made enrichment such a big deal, if they wanted a way out, we would be giving them a face saver. For me, these negotiations are about us being willing to give them a face saver, not about them giving us a face saver. So now I want to move on to the, to the hot topic that, that really exists now in town, which is, of course, the congressional sanctions legislation and whether or not that ought or ought not to go forward. As the report notes, um, both Iran and the administration take the position that the JPA basically rules out uh, further sanctions uh, while the negotiations are going on. And the administration says that that applies to this legislation, even though the legislation says that the sanctions would not take effect until the end of the, until 180 days or the end of the negotiations. They say you'd basically be violating the agreement and you'd be giving the Iranians an excuse to walk out and our allies would blame us. Uh, but I want to ask each of the panel members to give your view of this, and I want to start with Dennis, just because he happened to have an op-ed today, which he published in the wrong place, but nevertheless, <laughs> uh, lay out his view of what, what, what he thinks uh, is that, that piece said. It was only because of the link. That's the only reason. <laughs> uh, Jackson has the right, I think the, the, the A, I, I believe, as I've, as I've said so far, there's no way to get a rollback for rollback deal, which is what we're talking about, a serious rollback for rollback deal, unless you maintain the pressure. And that's, by the way, that's the position of the people on the Hill. And I agree that that's right. Now, the administration's position is that if you, if you adopt these sanctions right now in legislation, you are going to give the Iranians a more high ground. They're going to walk away from the negotiations, or even if they stay, they, you know, they'll negotiate in a tougher way because of this pressure. And all of our uh, the allies, or at least the other members of the 5 plus 1, including the French at this point, accept that logic. And I'm a big believer when it comes to diplomacy, the key to good diplomacy is taking away excuses, not giving them. So how do you square these two? That you need to have pressure on the one hand, but you don't want to give them an easy excuse to be able to somehow make us the ones who are responsible for problems in the negotiation, not them. My suggestion, my way to bridge it would be for uh, the administration now to go to the Hill and say, we will agree with you on what the sanctions are going to be. In return, don't adopt the legislation right now. The administration's position right now, look, you know, wait for this to be over. If it doesn't work, then obviously you'll be able to adopt sanctions. Everybody knows them. But that's the Congress still taking the initiative and not the administration. If the administration were to take the initiative, they would still be consistent with what they've said, because the sanctions wouldn't be adopted even in legislation. And they would be doing the equivalent of what the Iranians are doing right now. The Iranians right now are working on a next generation of centrifuges, which means the Iranians are creating a fact. Even as the negotiations are going on, the Iranians are creating a fact. There's no reason why the administration can't do the same, which is to create a fact that is equivalent, completely consistent with the, with the terms of the agreement, and doesn't create the excuse that adopting legislation right now does. Steve, your view? I, I think as Dennis has just suggested, um, there are lots of ways to address this sanctions issue, this desire in, in Congress to um, keep the pressure on uh, that would not compromise or, or, or violate the, uh, the undertakings of, of the Obama administration in the uh, joint plan of action. Um, and Dennis has just outlined one. You know, I would argue actually that the current proposal uh, doesn't violate the JPA because, as I understand it, currently what, what is being promoted by uh, Chairman Menendez and others on the Hill are sanctions that would only take effect at some point in the future if Iran didn't follow through and negotiate in good faith on the, on the basis of the, the JPA framework. So, uh, you know, to my mind, those are sort of conditional or, or Potential sanctions, they're not actual sanctions that are being imposed, but uh, obviously the Obama administration has, has come to a different view of that. Um, now, I, I think, uh, forgive me, Ray, I, I think you were probably going to say this, but I'll, maybe I'll steal a little of your thunder. I, I, I suspect that the, uh, the larger issue, at least for the Obama administration, uh, isn't uh, the, the sanctions themselves and whether that would put them in a position of, of uh, 
not fulfilling their, their commitments in the JPA. Rather, it's the, the aspect of the pending sanctions legislation that would seek to define or at least spell out Congress's view about what should be in the long-term agreement. Um, and, and I think that, at least as much as the, as the sanctions element, uh, irritates the administration. Uh, I think they're in a position, they don't really want Congress's advice on what's to be in, in the, uh, the long-term agreement. I think they want maximum flexibility to come up with whatever agreement uh, they're able to come up with. Uh, they don't want a yardstick <clears throat> or benchmark to be established uh, against which the negotiated result can be compared and found wanting. Uh, and uh, I guess I can understand why they wouldn't want that. Uh, on the other hand, um, if what we want is, is not just a diplomatic agreement here, but rather <clears throat> a diplomatic agreement that um, fully addresses U.S. national security interests, then I'm actually in favor of yardsticks and benchmarks to, uh, to make sure that we get a, a, uh, as good agreement as possible. So um, I understand the, the, the reluctance of, of the negotiators to be held to any standards, but I, I think uh, to the degree Congress is trying to establish standards, uh, that's a, an admirable thing and, and it should be supported. Ray, do you think the Iranians are bluffing when they say they'll walk away if this bill passes? Uh, I think both sides are not going to walk away from the table in six months or a year. This table has been set for 10 years. Uh, and given the fact that neither side sees an alternative to negotiations, I don't think either side is going to walk away. I don't think we'll walk away in six months or a year. I don't think Iranians will. Um, the most persistent aspect of U.S.-Iran relationship is the diplomacy. Uh, I would say just one thing. I mean, I agree with Dennis. I think the administration should have worked it out. But they held that because I'm a uniter, not a divider. Um, <laughs> I'm known as that. Uh, but I would go again. I would expand the canvas. Uh, despite all the discord and disagreement, the Iran policy is actually has been, up to JPA, a bipartisan policy. Uh, the, I always say that when I'm asked who's the intellectual architect of the Obama administration's Iran policy, I say Condi Rice. She's the one that came out with the notion of two-track policy negotiations and economic pressure as potentially yielding a negotiated outcome. She came up with that. Dennis didn't come up with that. Secretary Clinton didn't come up with that. No, that's a, that was a Condi Rice concept. Lots wrong with it, by the way. But it was essentially a conceptual foundation that the administration inherited, accepted, and embraced. And probably implemented with more vigor and efficiency than its predecessor. All the bills on the Hill were actually bipartisan bills, including the sanctions bill of 2010, which actually stipulates uh, that agreement, the final agreement, has to have dismantling of Iran's nuclear facility. That's already stipulated in the sanctions bill in July of 2010, which was passed by the Senate by 99-0 and signed on July the 11th by Barack Obama. In some way, the new Menendez bill is redundant to that. Just those principles have already been stipulated. Uh, I think what has happened, though, and this is very dangerous for the administration, they no longer have a bipartisan policy. And we no longer have a national Iran policy, we have a sectarian policy. And if you look at the Bush administration's record, at some point, the Bush administration no longer had a national Iraq policy, it had a sectarian policy, it had a Bush administration policy. And given the fact that there was no national consensus underlying it, it quickly evaporated. The Obama administration would have been wise to sustain this bipartisan coalition if it wanted this Iran policy to survive its time in office. I don't know if the sanctions were going to come to the Senate or not. I suspect the procedural manipulation. Harry Bird, his predecessor from Virginia. I'm really we are here. Historian, aren't you? Yeah, I, I think I think Senator Senator Reid can actually prevent it. But if I was looking at this from the administration's perspective, perspective, 60 senators basically have rejected my Iran policy today. The entire Republican Party, and it just didn't have to come to that. I think it had worked. If they had worked this out, it would have maintained the bipartisan character of this policy. And let me just say one more thing about that. Uh, when Mr. Arakshi was asked, the Deputy Foreign Minister, whether the Iran will adhere to protocols, additional protocols, he says, well, that's up to the respectable majlis. Uh, in some cases, I have to say that Mr. Arakshi is more deferential to the Parliament of Thought 
that is the most matchless that we have been to an elected parliament. <coughs> And I think that's the shortcoming. If the administration wants the Iran policy to survive, uh, I, I think it took a long step. Hi, thanks. Um, we pick up something that Ray said. Also, I agree with what others said before me. I think you took kind of right that there are two prong policy, and I think the, the, the most effect, the potential for a most effective policy on Iran is three prong: uh, diplomacy, sanctions, and a credible military option. I think that the administration clearly is fixated on diplomacy. They're opposed to the sanctions. And so right now, our whole Iran policy revolves completely and solely around diplomacy. I, I don't, I'm not optimistic that that's going to work out. I think to take another, a different view about sanctions, my only concern about the debate on sanctions, Jackson, is that and I know the, and I supported the I support the sanctions. I would hope the Senate would let it go to the floor and it could be voted on, since there is bipartisan support for it, and I think uh, most Americans support. Um, but I think that um, there's been a bit of a distortion by those pushing uh, the, the uh, sanctions, not intentional distortion, but I think implicit, which is that there, because there's such a focus on the sanctions bill. Uh, it almost it suggests, again, I think that's unintentional by the supporters, that sanctions are going to solve this problem. And uh, they haven't. Uh, you could say they've certainly inflicted damage on the Iranian economy. You could argue perhaps they brought you Rouhani, which you could argue whether that was good or bad. Uh, I think, but uh, they haven't succeeded so far in slowing or stopping a nuclear Iran. Unless you say that sanctions got to the GPA, the JPA, and the JPA is going to get you a, a good deal. But if you don't believe that, uh, then sanctions haven't been successful. So I think this focus on sanctions, in a way, has been a bit distorted as well. That, oh, if we just get the sanctions bill, now we'll solve things. Uh, I think that's the implication. I'm not saying that's stated. But that's not true either. We'll just continue where we've been going, which is. Uh, you know, the Iranians will make progress, that is pointed out before, uh, and, uh, and uh, we'll just put more pressure on them. We have to be clear, let's step back about where we are in our Iran policy. Sanctions alone isn't going to do it, it hasn't done it so far, but this would be more intense. <laughs> Diplomacy alone isn't going to do it either. The key missing element in all this is a credible military option, and unfortunately that, no matter how many times the administration will say this, and I can't even remember the last time they uttered this about all options being on the table. No one believes it. Certainly not after Syria. Not after they accuse the supporters of sanctions of being warmongers. No one believes that this administration is prepared to fulfill the president's pledge to use all, all elements of U.S. power. So I find in a way that you have those that support the sanctions make, make people think that that's, that alone is going to resolve this, even though they'll tell you won't. The administration is focused just on diplomacy, and yet, and I'm not saying none of us, none of us want, let's say, this to be resolved militarily. Uh, that's certainly not the first resort, but as a last resort, that's U.S. policy. And uh, I think it has to be all three of those elements, and I think we just have to remind ourselves when we talk about sanctions about how three of these elements have to be viable. I want to, I'm going to, there are a lot of people here and I'd like to open it up for questions, but first I just want to ask one more thing and pick up on a couple of interesting things that were said. Ray said something very interesting. He said, you know, in six months the Iranians are not going to walk away from this and we're not going to walk away from this. Nobody's going to want to walk away from this table. And Mike said, no, but military action is part of our policy, but nobody wants military action. And yet your, the report that's being issued today here says, you should give this 180 days. Not, not a year, just six months. And if in six months there's no agreement, it says we should move very rapidly, start ratcheting up the pressure, and we should step back and let Israel, and support Israel if they want to take military action. And the report essentially says. You know, it struck me, reading that, even coming from a uh, relatively hawkish editorial page, that that's going to be a pretty tough sell in Washington to say after six months, uh, with, with, with tipping over the table, or giving Israel carte blanche to start military action when you're in a situation in which essentially the clock is stopped uh, and there isn't dramatic Iranian advance advancement toward a bomb. So I just want to press the panel on this point of timing. Why do we need to take 
dramatic action in 180 days? And why wouldn't we be better off um, sitting at the table indefinitely rather than moving towards military action if the clock is essentially stopped? Anybody want to go first? Uh, I'll, I'll start. Okay. We'll, go the, we'll go this way. Just to be clear, it has been U.S. policy all along that we would support Israel if it chose to attack. The, the President said that uh, uh, just when he was in Israel last year, so you know, uh, that Israel should defend, can defend itself. And, uh, but I think the, the reason why we focus on the Israeli element is because that is, I think, the, the last remaining stick right now. And as you point out, Jackson, I think uh, we're not calling for it. We're just saying, if Israel chooses to do so, we would understand it and we would be supportive. Uh, and uh, but what we don't want, and this is as I mentioned, I think one of the flaws of the deal is that this deal kind of undercuts the legitimacy of an Israeli strike while they're talking. And as Dennis and as Ray said, they're going to keep talking, and therefore we think it's not right. We're not saying that on day on July 21st Israel should strike. We're just saying. We don't believe that talks, we don't, if talks continue, it doesn't mean uh, that the Israelis, or any allies, but we all know it's the Israelis, the most viable one. Uh, uh, we don't, it doesn't mean it suggests that the Israelis don't have a right. It means to say they have a right if they choose to, and we would be supportive. Of course, we hope that we just will get resolved diplomatically. So uh, we just wanted to re inject this idea because. The concern is, as Ray points out, the talks are going to continue endlessly. The administration on July 21st is right before it's going to say, hey, you know, we're getting really close, we're making some progress, let's extend this another six months. And by the way, let's be really clear, it's not just the Israelis, a lot of focus is on them. Let's not forget the Saudis. We all know that our Arab allies are curious at us right now. We did this deal, the negotiations were mostly done just between us and the Iranians. We cut out the Israelis, we cut out the Saudis. Uh, they feel they have no faith right now uh, in us, and we need. To, and I think the best chance of actually, of of, of uh, in a way, you could argue to disincentivize the Israelis and others to say, "Hey, we'll support you if you feel it's when you feel it's right." But let's keep trying to resolve this diplomatically. I think we have to really restore our our uh, the support of our allies, and this is also certainly one way to do it. Both. I mean, obviously, we all know one of the ironies is about the Iran stuff in, the, in recent times is the Obama administration, I think, in cutting this deal has done more, and also what happened with Syria by not striking militarily has done more to bring the Israelis and the Arabs together probably right now than in any time since 1948. And uh, uh, it's an ironic uh, byproduct. Dennis, I don't know how many years of those times that you've been working on bringing that together. But uh, since you left the administration, I think there's been a lot of progress on that. <laughs> Obviously, there's a correlation. <laughs> uh, as I said, I think I suspect these negotiations will continue if the comprehensive agreement proves elusive. I think there'll be some sufficient progress on some interim measures, inspections, and so on. Uh, the table was in place, the negotiating table, when there was no progress, and I suspect they'll be in place. Now that there is some progress, uh, I do agree with Mike in one way. Uh, I think JPA has forestalled, if not delegitimized, if not made unnecessary, whatever phrase you want to use, the employment of force. And I'm not quite sure if Israelis are not particularly grateful for that. Uh, uh, because I don't think Israelis want to use military force against Iran. I think they have some concerns about the, about the impeachment agreement. But I. As I said, I, I suspect that these negotiations will persist longer than either participant, a participant at this point, perhaps even envisions. But well, Jackson, I, the premise of your question was that the clock is stopped, and um, and therefore why, why not keep it stop, uh, stopped uh, indefinitely, um, at least as long as it takes for, for the parties to make progress. Um, I, I think I disagree with that premise. But I don't think the the clock is stopped, I think arguably it's slowed, uh, but, but it's not stopped. Um, and you know, the, I think your question really raises, it really goes to the issue of what happens at the end of six months, because the JPA purports to be in an agreement that lasts for six months, during which time there's to be a follow-on negotiation to come up with a long term. 
long-term agreement. But then toward the end of the JPA, it says, well, actually, the goal is to reach that long-term agreement uh, in no more than one year. Um, there's a contradiction right there. Um, this agreement lasts for six months. At least it's in the mind of somebody that maybe it'll take a year. Um, so what's going to happen after, after six months? Um, you know, I suppose the easy answer is they'll just agree to continue this for, for another six months. Uh, I don't know that that's going to be that easy uh, because I think if I were the Iranians, uh, I, I, would, um, I would rationalize that part of the price I extracted for the concessions I made here was $4.2 billion in, in uh, money that's mine uh, and being you know, improperly or I'm there, you're unlawfully uh, retained in, in foreign bank accounts. That's to be restored to me. Well, that was for six months. If you want another six months, I want another X number of billion dollars. I suspect if it, if it comes to that, we're going to have we're going to hear about those kinds of, of discussions. Um, another thing, and I hesitate to get down in the weeds here, but um, one of the uh, the basic undertaking on our side was uh, we would stop trying to ratchet up pressure under the oil sanctions, and we would allow uh, oil exports to continue to a group of countries that are, that are currently importing oil from Iraq, but they're importing at a, a level that's been reduced over the last few, few years. And the idea is, as spelled out here, that they'll be able to continue to, to import at that level, but not at a higher level. And then last week, um, the administration issued new regulations trying to implement that. In my reading of the regulations, it's, it's not evident that they've done a very good job, and, and perhaps they're not even capable of holding the exports to those countries to the current reduced levels. Uh, the, the waiver authority that I saw pretty much said you know, the sanctions no longer apply to oil exports to those countries. So maybe there's some master plan where they think they're going to somehow titrate the, uh, the, the amount of uh, oil that's exported to these countries. But it, it's not evident to me from reading uh, the regulations that were announced that, that they succeeded in that. So uh, you know, far from maintaining a limit on the amount of oil that Iran is exporting, it may well be that over the next six months we discover basically the, the, the door is wide open to them. So um, anyway, that, that, that's a long way of saying um, I think there, there are a number of factors in play here. And um, certainly at the end of six months, we're going to hear from people in the U.S. Congress who say, well, now's the time to wrap. The sanctions have brought us to where we brought us to the ability to get this. Uh, if we want to get we, we failed in the first six months. We're going to get a permanent agreement. We need tougher sanctions. And uh, you know, I guess from what I've said, you know I, I, I can support that. I think the you know the essence of what you're saying, no saying what you just said. I do think it's not automatic that it'll be renewed after six months, but I can see a dynamic that will create a, a mutual interest to do it. I do think there could be an Iranian default position. The Iranian default position could be exactly what you were leading to, which is, in a sense, try to count on the psychology of the market in fact working over time, even if it doesn't work the way some of the critics say, you know, the Iranians could, could wait to see if it actually will allow things to evolve that way. And then a default position for them would be, look, all right, so we, we've got almost 20,000 centrifuges. You know, we have at least a 1,000 of the next generation. And their attitude could be, this is an outcome that they could live with for some time because it will actually mean that they are a nuclear threshold state. And that at some point down the road, they could choose, at a moment of their choice, to say, all right, now we'll dash. Uh, and I think that's the, the reason that, in the end, is not sustainable from our end, is that that's precisely what we're saying they can't be. So uh, if the objective continues to be, as, it, as the President has articulated, the prevention of Iran from having nuclear weapons, we certainly don't want them to be in a position that at a certain point they're able to dash to that. Uh, and so that's why I think that there is a, there's an argument for, to A, maintain the pressure. There's an argument to, um, in a sense, to do what Mike was describing vis-a-vis the Israelis. Uh, there's also an argument for us in terms of, the, you know, Mike says that no one believes the administration will use force and he cited the, um, you know, the argument that's been made out of some of the White House that those who adopt sanctions right now are, in a sense, choosing the path of war. Well, as I point out in what I've written, uh, there's a certain irony in that position if you think about it. The logic of that position literally says, 
all right, if you take away the diplomatic option, you leave us only the war option, only the use of force option. So that actually, if you, the logic of that argument actually says, the president means what he says on preserving all options on the table. Uh, and while it may not be believed at this point, uh, it is something in some ways that I think the administration ironically ought to be emphasizing. I actually think uh, if we address the Saudi, Emirati, and Israeli concerns, it might also not give the Iranians the same degree of comfort that they may have right now. Uh, and I do think at the end of the day, the, the key to diplomacy being effective is that ultimately there's a course of element to it, and the course of element has to be believed. If the course of element is believed, I think we actually have a chance to produce the kind of rollback deal that uh, at least I was talking about. I think it's very hard to achieve, and I think it's very, it's probably impossible to achieve if the Iranians feel that there isn't going to be ultimately a high price to pay uh, if they don't accept the fact that they'll have to roll back. Yeah, Jackson, do you want to take that one? Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, just want to emphasize this what Steve and uh, Dennis just said. I think. Key point, I think, is what you're saying. If the, the nuclear program was frozen, that would be one issue. But as Steve points out, it's only yet exploding. And I think, as Dennis suggests, uh, that we believe that the best chance of resolving this diplomatically is all three elements of an effective policy are viable, which is a credible military option, uh, tough sanctions, and, uh, and diplomacy, and the concern I have, and the others here is going forward, is right now it seems focused just on the diplomacy. Okay, I'd like to open it up. Uh, uh, please uh, raise your hand if you recognize. Is there a microphone out there somewhere? Yes, we have a circulating microphone, so wait for the microphone and please identify yourself before asking your question. Yes, sir, over here. Thank you. It's uh, Dana Marshall with Transnational Strategy Group. Thanks very much for organizing. This has been a very good discussion. I, maybe my question sort of pins, pings off of uh, Dennis's last statement about coercive measures, and I wanted to see if the panel could drill down a little bit into two legs of that. One thing that we haven't talked much about, although I think Dennis mentioned a little bit about it, is what's happening in Europe. Because in terms of sanctions, even if the consensus clearly is not any longer on the Congress in terms of our own sanctions, I think we can pretty much rely that U.S. companies are not going to be going to Tehran tomorrow. But indeed, the most important markets and suppliers might be more the Europe's, the China's, the Japan's. Has, has all that's happened since November 24th, how has that changed that, with the, the Davos thing being the most interesting? So that's sort of one important element of continuing coercion. The other one is Saudi, and their threat themselves to arm themselves. Um, could that be another credible, perhaps the most credible, uh, kind of, of a military threat? I wonder if the panel could talk a little bit about that. Well, let me pick up on the second point first. Um, I, I do think that the Saudis have been pretty clear that uh, whatever the Iranians have, they're going to have. And I don't see the Saudis using force against the Iranians, but the Saudis are involved in what is a systematic process of competition across the region with the Iranians. There seems to be a kind of mutual image they have of each other. Each, is, each sees the other trying to encircle them. And uh, for the Saudis, this is an existential kind of struggle. We talk about the Israelis looking at the, at the Iranian nuclear uh, program as, as posing an existential threat at a certain point. The Saudis see Iran through an existential lens not because of the nuclear issue, but because of the, the character of the religious competition, the competition within the region, uh, and what they see is, is efforts of encirclement and subversion. So, you know, I think that I, I wouldn't see them using force directly against the Iranians, but I see them continuing to pursue a, a policy designed to, to uh, compete and try to change the balance of power within the region. Um, on the on this broader question, uh, Steve made the made the point about he doesn't you know, he's concerned about what the regulations are with regard to what's going to happen on oil. But I'm not seeing at this point any change. 
they still seem to be about a million barrels a day in terms of export. Now, again, this becomes an interesting thing to watch. If, in fact, that goes up, then obviously the kind of pressure on the Iranians goes down. Uh, and this is something that's measurable. This is something we can see. So those who make the case and the administration is in the forefront of saying that the, the architecture of sanctions has not been changed. The limitation doesn't deal with the structure of sanctions, and what it does is it actually adds to the Iranian appetite to get the relief without providing the kind of relief they really need. And we'll be able to watch this over the next several months. If the administration argument is right, you'll see it, and if it's not, we'll also begin to see it, and then you really have to make some judgments, because then, if it turns out that the, the argument of, of those who say the psychology of the market is going to take over, and the sanctions will fall at their own weight, then we really will have lost our leverage, and the key is, if we're going to have an agreement, is not to lose that leverage. Yeah, uh, you, you raised two, uh, Danny, you raised uh, two very uh, interesting issues. Um, on the first one about you know, Europeans and, and it comes to sanctions, uh, you know, obviously there have been a lot of news reports since the agreement was reached that uh, European businessmen are very eager to get to Iran because they think the door is opening and they want to get ahead of the line. Um, I think that's not surprising, but I think that's also um, one of the reasons that people like Chairman Menendez are very eager to, to keep the pressure on, on sanctions because they're, you know, they make the argument that this <coughs> sanctions regime was very difficult to construct. It took many, many years. I mean, the Grand Libya Sanctions Act passed in 1996. Here we are um, 18 years later. Uh, um, and you know, it took a long time to construct it. Uh, you can probably, you know, if the momentum is lost, uh, you know, it can start to, to fall apart very quickly. And that, that's a concern that people like uh, Chairman Menendez have. And they have evidence to point to. You know, press reports that, you know, that come out. Um, on, the, on the salaries, you know, I think, I don't know if you're talking about the, you know, the, the, the off-reporting threat that the reported by people like Dennis that the, the Saudis would seek their own nuclear weapon um, if, if Iran got a nuclear weapon. Um, let me turn that a little bit and say, you know, I, I think, I mean, that's obviously something to pay attention to. Uh, but um, I, I also think uh, we need to be mindful that, that there is a competition in the region, and um, I, I think the other countries aren't going to be left. Those who feel threatened by Iran. And uh, there's, there's some history here that's relevant to me. Um, the, you know, for, for about a decade after Russia announced that it was going to complete the Bushir Civil Nuclear Power Reactor for, for Iran, the position of the United States government you know, under the Clinton administration and, and for the first half of the Bush administration was we were opposed to that. We didn't want Iran to have a civil nuclear power plant that had all this oil. This was obviously part of a weapons program in a country with that. that that much in the way of hydrocarbon resources, they couldn't possibly need a nuclear power reactor. Um, and throughout that period, you know, the only nuclear power reactor we were talking about in that part of the world was, was 2004, 2005, the Bush administration decided, and I was there at the time, uh, the Bush administration decided, you know, we're really losing on this Bushir thing, and what we're gonna focus on is enrichment, and we think, for some of the reasons that Dennis made about it, Building, you know, holding your coalition together, we will retreat on Bushir because we think that'll strengthen our position to fight on, on the enrichment issue. So uh, the Bush administration retreated. So okay, we no longer have an objection to a civil nuclear power reactor in Iran. Uh, we, what we object to is, is enrichment. And um, almost instantaneously, uh, the United Arab Emirates announces, you know, civil nuclear power is something we've been really interested in. And uh, we, we, want, we want to establish a program. And um, I mean, you know where that program is today. Um, you know, the Saudis have since put out a lot of feelers about a civil nuclear program as well. Um, where we are today, I mean, with the JPA, is, is you know, a further retreat in U.S. policy. Uh, you know, Bush retreated on the Bushir reactor, and Obama's clearly retreating on the question of will Iran be able to enrich. Um, do, we, do we actually think that if we agree that a country like Iran can be trusted to have an enrichment capability, that the other countries in the region are all going to say, well, that's okay, we don't, we don't need one ourselves. Um, I guess I'm a little bit skeptical of that, you know, just looking at what happened with the UAE, I, I kind of expect that somebody's going to step forward and say, uh, we'd like enrichment too. Uh, and, um, and then what, what's the U.S. position? 
Right, no, we, I, we only trust the wrong. You're, you're an ally, and we can't trust you. But, you, know, you, you so it, in fact, it has been the position of the U.S. for a decade now to try and discourage enrichment, not just in the Middle East, but all over the world. Um, you know, I, I think that entire policy uh, is in tatters after, after this event with Iran, because I, I think it becomes untenable to go to friends of the United States and say, you know, as a good global citizen, you're, you shouldn't seek enrichment. We only trust countries like Iran. Which friends of America can't be trusted. And, and, yeah, I just don't think that's a terrible position. So um, you know, I, I wouldn't look just at nuclear weapons issue. I would look at what happens across the board and, and you know, other countries seeking to, to keep up with what Iran is, is uh, given under this and other Jackson? Yeah, any thoughts? Do uh, you mind if I just add one thing? Um, just quickly, I think, so just to clarify what Steve said, I think to summarize, one thing I would add, what's at stake here is not just about preventing the Iran, it's just each one is an enemy of the United States, uh, or less so it seems like recently. Uh, but it's also that we don't want to, we want to prevent a nuclear Saudi Arabia, and so on, and that's not in the, U it's not in the U.S. interest either, even though the Saudis are allies for them to have nuclear weapons. So what's at stake here, what it, and at stake, and the, the, the issue of a nuclear Iran is momentous enough, but it's certainly even more momentous than then leads to a nuclear Saudi Arabia. And I know Dennis has pointed out in an interview when he left the White House a couple of years ago, the Saudis told him that they would go ahead and that there's a high probability that the Iranians get it, that they would go, that the Saudis would go ahead and get their own bomb. And this on the second issue uh, about sanctions, I just want to point out, Dennis is right, I mean, it is still too soon. Although I saw some reports that suggest that oil exports are starting to spike up in January, but it's still too soon. The month isn't over yet to know that. But the, the JPA makes you very nervous about that going forward because it says not only the pause efforts to further reduce Iran's crude oil sales, it says for oil, such oil sales suspend the EU and U.S. sanctions on associated insurance transportation services. And the sanctions on the insurance uh, I think have been very important here, and uh, because then the buyers of Iranian oil had to insure their own vessels, uh, and now going forward, if they don't have to do that, it certainly suggests that there should be more. It's more. It's very likely that there'll be more oil sales. But as Dennis points out, this is something we will be. We need to monitor very, very uh, you know, right away. Yeah, let's get in a couple more questions. Uh, yes, sir. At the end here. Hi, my name is Peter DC. I'm with the Air Force Association, formerly with JINSA and AFPC. This is a bigger question, and it's for Jackson O'Pound. We're worried about nuclear weapons in Iran because we're worried about what they'll achieve with them. But the question comes down to can they still achieve their strategic objectives without nuclear weapons? And so is Iran's position is we'll pause long enough to get the sanctions off our back, but our strategic objectives, including the destruction of Israel, for example, remain on the table. Okay, let's take two or three questions, and then I'll invite the panel to answer. Yes, ma'am. Um, Wait for the microphone. It's okay. Um, my name is Vita Charo. I'm a private citizen. Um, uh, it was sort of a meta question, and that is, it seems to me that um, the administration has chosen to negotiate from what appears to be a position of weakness rather than a position of strength. And I'd like to know uh, why this is. In the back. Uh, Harris Shaw, American University. So in 2013, in November, actually, the Israeli military released an assessment that said that, uh, in effect, Iran was a nuclear threshold state, and that uh, they're not, they haven't decided, basically, whether they want to create a nuclear weapon or not. Uh, U.S. intelligence also confirms that assessment. So I know we're talking about extending time on the clock, but the political decision uh, in Tehran, uh, according to U.S. and Israeli intelligence, is that the decision hasn't been made yet. So I'm kind of wondering, like, how are we playing with the larger question of you know, or do they even want a bomb? 
Okay, I, let's, let's, let's stop there and, and, and have some answers. I thought the first question was particularly interesting because it goes to the question, is, is Iran looking for a bomb or are they looking for hegemony in the Middle East? And uh, can they get the latter without the former? And, uh, and that's something I know Ray has, has written about. Uh, in the Washington Post, so why don't we start with <laughs> <laughs> it? Must be true. It must be true then. Uh, I, I think it's been a sort of a constant Iranian objective to have a greater say in the political developments of the region, going back to monarchy for years. Uh, the difference was the Shah thought that Iranian predominance is something that has to be negotiated with the United States, while the Iran Islamic Republic believes that. Iranian predominance is something that has to come in defiance and confrontation with the United States. So the objective has remained somewhat the same, but the manner of expression of it is different. Uh, I would say some of the discussions that have taken place here and in negotiations, and I know Jackson has written about that in Washington Post, is like, we do, we're talking technical enrichment. All these issues are playing themselves out in a region called the Middle East. The region today is divided in a new Cold War, pitting Saudi Arabia against the Iranian bloc. It's a, it's a Cold War underwritten by sectarian identities, which means it's likely to last longer. Uh, Syria is the wellstone of this particular conflict. Uh, so long as this Cold War is taking place, both Saudis and Iranians will look for the type of weaponries and capabilities that can enhance their leverage, no matter what happens in Geneva. And I will say for the United States, if we don't have a Syria policy, we don't have a Middle East policy. Because Syria is defining the political culture and political conditions of the Middle East. If you don't have a Syria policy, you don't have a counterterrorism policy. Because the a radicalized political environment is creating radical political actors uh, with Al Qaeda contesting cities in Iraq and also in, in Syria itself. Uh, and this is not something that can be adjusted by drone wars, but sort of a unique American synergy of violence and mass entertainment. Uh, and, if, and if you don't have a Syria policy, none of these issues are really going to resolve themselves at the end. The Saudis and Iranians are locked into a conflict that's likely to be enduring and protracted. And they're both going to look for capabilities to achieve predominance and, a, and a, some sort of a leverage in that conflict. And you want to address this question of whether the Iranians have made a decision or not made a decision about whether they to go forward and nuclear weapons? It has always been my view that this is a nuclear weapons program. It makes no sense otherwise. Iran does not require nuclear energy. Iran does not require an enrichment program because it doesn't have enough natural depositories of enrichment to actually sustain an enrichment program. It has to purchase natural uranium from Africa. Uh, the, the only way this makes sense is for it to be a nuclear weapons program, and that has to be seen in the context of Iranian policy in the region, where it is essentially trying to become a hegemonic power without having a land, without having a substantial land army. Uh, it wants to do so with missiles, with extended deterrence, and with unconventional capabilities. Today, in the Middle East, and particularly in the Gulf, there is an unconventional balance of power that is unlikely to be adjusted by Iranians. They cannot have enough sophisticated weaponry the way the Saudis and others do, because the Saudis and others have access to the American market and the European military market. The only way Iran can adjust and negate this imbalance of conventional power is to enhance its unconventional capabilities and reliable delivery system in terms of missiles and projectiles. If you look at Fordo, Fordo makes no sense. Uh, to be a uh, a commercial facility for enrichment. Uh, if you look at Iraq, it makes no sense to be building a heavy water plant if you're interested uh, in generating electricity. Uh, and the only thing I would add to what Ray had to say is that the one other way the Iranians obviously compete is not just through the unconventional in the sense of uh, nuclear weapons, but obviously they use militias. This is part of what they're doing throughout the region. It's Hezbollah, it's Qatayb Hezbollah. If you look at Syria, just as an example, the, the numbers now of extreme Shia militias in Syria may actually outnumber uh, those who are associated with Al-Qaeda. Uh, I've also got a comment on this uh, this last question. Uh, there's a difference between having a nuclear weapons program and having a nuclear weapon. 
uh, kind of nuclear weapons program that gives you everything you need to have a nuclear weapon without actually turning the last screw and, and testing it and you know, demonstrating to the world that you have it. And, and, I, and if I understood the question correctly, it was, you know, there's doubt, there's a suspicion they haven't decided whether to have a nuclear weapon. Uh, but you know, for, for the reasons that we, we just pointed out for both uh, Dennis and Ray, I don't think there's any doubt about Iran having made a decision to have a nuclear weapons program, because that's the only explanation for all the things that we see taking place in Iran. And uh, whether they will take the last step or not is, is, you know, is something that I, I think remains to be seen. Uh, and, and let me just sort of draw an analogy here, a historical analogy that I, I think uh, is informative. Um, North Korea uh, tested their first nuclear weapon in 2006. Uh, and that was when we knew for a fact that North Korea had a weapon. But if you go back and, and read what's been declassified, uh, U.S. intelligence assessments from the 1990s, it turns out that starting about 1996, the assessment of the U.S. intelligence community was Iran, pro or, sorry, North Korea probably had a nuclear weapon. Okay? We didn't know for sure, but looking at the program that they had in place and what we suspected about, and, and we had less insight uh, into what was going on there than we, we do with Iran, but the, the assessment was they probably had a nuclear weapon. Now, I, I don't know whether they actually had the nuclear weapon in 1996, but at some point between 1996 and 2006, they actually acquired one. Uh, and they actually tested it in, uh, in 2006. But my point is, for that 10-year period between 1996 and 2006, if you're the President of the United States and your intelligence community is telling you they probably have a nuclear weapon, how do you treat them? I mean, do you just say, well, okay, they, there's some doubt, so we're, we're just going to proceed on the assumption they don't have one. I mean, no, I mean, to the contrary, the intelligence community is telling you they probably have one. Uh, you're going to have to treat them as if they did. And um, there can be some important strategic benefits, security benefits to a country if it's treated by other countries as if it has nuclear weapons, whether or not it actually has it. You know, I think a country like that is going to get a little bit more deference from its neighbors and from, from the great powers if they're afraid that they're dealing with a nuclear armed country. So uh, Iran, I, I'm not aware of an assessment, an assessment today that they probably have a nuclear weapon, but uh, the assessment that they could have one in short order if they wanted it, which is what this whole discussion about undetectable breakout is about, um, is essentially the same thing. Uh, you know, Iran is really close to being in a place where they have to be treated as if they had a nuclear weapon. And that has all kinds of implications for us, for Israel, for, for Iran's neighbors in the Persian Gulf region. And, and so I, I, I don't actually dispute them the notion that maybe they haven't made the final decision uh, to whether to produce a weapon. Uh, because I can see where they might see they get substantial benefit from putting themselves in that ambiguous space that was occupied by North Korea for about a decade. Great, let's try and fit in about two more questions. Yes, sir, here. Yeah. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Yul Terözcan. I'm the U.S. representative for uh, CHV, the main opposition party in Turkey. Um, I actually want to ask a question on Turkey. I mean, it's now clear that um, Erdogan's government has helped Iran uh, defy the sanctions uh, for many years. Uh, what will the U.S. administration do to ensure that uh, Erdogan's government doesn't undermine these talks again? Thanks. Yes, sir. In the front. We'll pay for Uh, Stuart Plum, the American Jewish International Relations Institute. <clears throat> My question, I'm a little perplexed about the uh, three prongs, the sanction diplomacy and the military option. Uh, the administration talks about how successful the sanctions have been, yet for years they've opposed most congressional efforts to, uh, to pass sanctions legislation, including uh, the most recent one on the table. So I'm not clear why they are so reluctant to use that weapon, using the word advisedly, uh, when at the same time they're not particularly interested in the military option. Uh, if somebody could explain that. The other question would be, on the military option, would there be ways to enhance the credibility uh, at this point uh, without actually uh, using it? Uh, for, I know, for example, a few months ago, uh, the Defense Department invited journalists to see the uh, test of the uh, 30,000 pound, a pound uh, bunker buster bomb that presumably could take the whole top of Fort Mountain off 
But I wonder if there are any other ways to uh, leaking information or something that would enhance the, that credibility. I'm interested in. Say your name. Sam. Sam. I'm interested in whether the red lines are precise enough so one can tell whether Iran is violating an agreement. I note, for example, that in your brochure on the task force and the plutonium, it relates to activities relating to the reactor. That's very vague. I can construe this narrowly as meaning activities that affect the reactor itself, the nuclear reactor, the heavy water reactor, or it can be activities that affect anything that has to do with the production of plutonium. And I'd like to know how one sets these red lines precisely and how the task force hopes to deal with these issues. Okay, let's have one last round of comments from the panel. And then let's left to right, Dennis, you go first. Um, look, I think on the question of Erdogan, the, the administration, since it is emphasizing how important it is to preserve the architecture of the sanctioned regime, if it looks like Turkey is, is defecting more in that regard, I suspect that you'll probably see some increasing efforts made to ensure that they don't. There were uh, very strong efforts made uh, with the Turks uh, over the last couple of years to uh, specifically with identifying particular Turkish banks uh, that were behaving in a certain way. So I suspect you'll, you could see more of that. Um, on your issue, the last question that was raised on the, on the issue of um, of, are the red lines sufficiently clear? There are fairly clear red lines built in. I mean, uh, to take one example, they can't be, there can't be any delivery of heavy, heavy water. There can't be, I mean, there's specific criteria that are built into the agreement that relate to that plan, and all those particular activities are identifiable. They're not vague. Um, on the question of uh, if you read the report, you'll see actually, yes, there's a number of examples that are given on what else could be done uh, to show that we mean what we, we say about all options being on the table, some of which relate to how you talk about uh, the Israelis and their right to self-defense. Some of it could well relate to how we talk about all options being on the table and what happens if diplomacy fails. I took, as I said, the, the fact that those there are some in the White House who have made the point that if you don't, that if you're pushing the sanctions legislation right now, you're choosing the path of war. The logic of that is you are den you're denying us the ability to have diplomacy work, which leaves only one choice, which is the use of force. You can even be rather than you know, rather than putting it in a negative, you could be saying, look, we don't want the use of force to be the outcome, but we've always made it clear that we're absolutely determined to prevent Iran from having a nuclear weapon or to be in a position where they can choose in a moment of their of their own decision to go for one. And that would trigger the use of force. I mean, there are ways to to, to add to, the, to that credibility. Uh, well, well, briefly, I'm not going to comment on the issue of Turkey because I'm on a panel with people who know a lot more about Turkey than I do, so um, I'll, I'll let them speak to that. Um, enhancing the credibility of the military option, um, yeah, I think there's a lot that can be done. Um, I, mean, I guess I would refer you, a number of us served together on a task force at the Bipartisan Policy Center a few years ago that actually issued a report along these lines, and uh, I think maybe we can just give you a, a citation to that or you know, a website address for it. Uh, but th th there, there are a lot of concrete ideas that, that were spelled out in that report about how to make the military option uh, more believable uh, to the Iranians and, and to our allies. Um, and then finally, on the, the question of whether the red lines are, are precise enough uh, to detect violations, um, I guess with respect to the joint plan of action, I, I agree with Dennis that this, this gives us some pretty clear benchmarks. Uh, I personally just have a larger concern with Iran, though, and that is, um, you know, in, in Dennis Rump, or, uh, Donald Rumsfeld's words, you know, we only know what we know, but we, we don't know what we don't know. Um, the, 
the Iranians have a history of concealment. Uh, and you know, most of what we know today about their nuclear, uh, we call it nuclear weapons program, uh, was not revealed by them. It was not declared by them initially to the IAEA. It was, it was leaked through a you know, Somebody found out about it and leaked it. Uh, but you know, previously secret activities were, were revealed. Uh, if there is not today a C, you know, some sort of covert uh, nuclear facility of some kind in Iran, it would be the first time in, in 20 years there hasn't been a, a covert nuclear program somewhere in Iran. Now, maybe, maybe there isn't one today. Uh, maybe maybe you know, the revelations that have all been exhausted and then there isn't anything more to be revealed. But um, again, that would be the first time in two decades if, if that's true. Uh, I'll just say a few things about the issue of the use of uh, force, because I think the assessment on the use of force has less to do with capabilities than with intentions. Uh, the American capabilities are granted, but the, the intention, I think, would be subject to some sort of a doubt at this point for a variety of reasons. Uh, number one, uh, this administration is similar to previous administrations really going back to the Cold War that have suggested that the problems of the Middle East are intractable and frustrating. However, this is the first one that has implied they're not important. Uh, and with the discussion that we're going to leave behind the wars and the Middle East, a place of intractable and unimportant complex, irresolvable complex, and move toward uh, Asia where there's commerce and opportunity and so on. Uh, so that kind of a notion of getting away from the Middle East militates against initiating new conflicts in the Middle East, uh, particularly with the determination to enter two wars. Uh, I would say around 2006 and 7, Iranians took the use of force very seriously by the Bush administration. I only know this in retrospect, like I know most things. Uh, with, the, with the now you see the appointment of General Jaffari, because the Iranian perspective at that time, the strategic doctrine was, uh, the United States will no longer invade and occupy countries as it did in 2003 with Iraq. This model of use of force it goes back to the Gulf War, the first Gulf War of 1991, whereby it uses overwhelming force and hopes for regime change. And therefore, General Jaffari had command, the current head of the Revolutionary Guards, to develop what he called the Mosaic Defense. Uh, the Mosaic Defense means Iran would no longer have a central command and control center, but have 31 command and control centers. So if you knock one off, the system can still survive. Uh, they didn't have to worry about the Bush administration taking military action against Iran as it came out, as it turned out. Uh, but today, I'm not quite sure, with all the evidence at their disposal, that they can take the threat of force seriously with the American seeking to exit from the Middle East with the sort of a situation that took place in Syria. And just reading Bob Gates' memoirs, where he seems to have one determination of Secretary of Defense, namely not to use force in the Middle East. Uh, that sort of comes across in terms of their calculations as well. So it's not a question of capability. At any point, even in the aftermath of the Iraq departure, we have about 28,000, 30,000 forces in the Gulf, 40,000 forces in the Gulf, but it's just a question of their, of their willingness to employ that leverage. Because, I get the last word. Yeah, OK. Thanks, Jackson. Uh, I'll just add to, on this issue of credibility of the military uh, strike. I think, as Donald said and so on, I think it'd be helpful for the administration, particularly the president, to talk about it. And I think it's not just that he says it off, uh, more often. It'd be nice if he mentioned it, for instance, in the State of the Union tomorrow, uh, because I think it's not just what he says, but where he says it. So he shouldn't just say it in front of when he goes to APAC. He doesn't just say it when he goes to Israel. But he should say it elsewhere, that this is something, uh, like I, uh, and, I know, uh, you know, uh, and I noticed that Secretary Kerry, in his speech at Davos last week, kind of suggest just the opposite, and most critical of those who focus on the military action. But I just saw this morning that he had an interview with al Arabiya uh, where he says we have a, we're ready with our military option. So that's great to say it in the Saudi organ, but it'd be good for him to say it in a broader company and, uh, and to say it often. I think is one of the questioners asked about the mock 30,000 pound massive ordnance penetrator good for, maybe they show uh, pictures of what the damage that could be done to show, because it is, is, uh, Ray says it's not an issue of our capability. We have it. The question is about is our will. And uh, we just have to, uh, and I think Congress could help out on this. It doesn't come up much, but I think there should be hearings on this issue. And, uh, and let there be a debate. 
uh, is, uh, you know, the Bush administration was criticized for Russia in a war. Uh, so why don't we have a debate about it? And uh, I think, first of all, it's healthy for the country to do so. I don't mean to sound naive, but I think it would be healthy. You could get military people, national security experts, testifying on both sides in Congress. And let's have a debate. And I think just having the debate alone would be significant and send an important signal. The problem with credibility when it's lost that it takes you have to really do a lot to restore it. Sometimes you have to go further than you would have otherwise. And that's the challenge I think the administration has. So if the President Obama maintains his uh, belief that he's prepared as a last resort to use military option, uh, he needs to do he needs to talk about it a lot. He should encourage Congress to have hearings about it. And Congress doesn't need his encouragement, they should do it anyway. And there should be a national debate about this issue. I think that would be very useful for the country. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you for coming. It's been a great discussion. And thank you to our panelists.